um, what we're gonna be what we're gonna be going over is is prayer, right? This is what this is the next theme that Jesus goes into, and it's prayer. And and if you don't know about prayer, prayer is one of the most important things in the Christian life. A, a Christian without a prayer life is merely even a Christian. But a Christian is supposed to be devoted to prayer. And what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God, the almighty God, the one that we have fellowship with now, the one that we were once enemies of, like the Bible says, but now we get to be called friends of God. Now we are adopted sons and daughters of this almighty God, and we have the privilege to pray to this God, to have fellowship with him. And it's truly a beauty. So let's begin in Matthew chapter 6, verse Verse 5. This is the first verse, and Jesus continues this, and he says, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. So here, it's very interesting. Off the bat, Jesus here paints a picture of, of what some people did. And what they did is that they would stand out in the public where they can be seen by men and they would pray. But they wouldn't pray to have that, that time and, and that intimate time with God. But it was just so that they can be seen by other men and gain their approval. Maybe they wanted to seem more spiritual than what people thought. Maybe they wanted to paint this picture of who they were, but it was a false reality. And the word that is, that, that is used here, that Jesus used for hypocrites, it's a very interesting word because in the Greek, the original text, the original meaning of this word means an actor, a stage player. Literally, someone who puts on an act. Someone who puts on a mask and disguises himself as someone else. And in the, in the biblical Greek, the, the true meaning of this is a dissembler, a pretender, or a simple hypocrite. Someone who poses like someone they're not. So when we see here, we pretty much see actors. People who are acting like they're these spiritual giants and these prayer warriors. And in reality, they're not. So look at what Jesus says here. He says at the very end, truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. Now, this is very interesting, right? Because you would be like, what, what type of reward do these people have? I didn't know that a hypocritical action deserves an award. But what's very interesting is that um, the Gospels is the, isn't the only place that references something like this. But in fact, Paul mentions something like this in Philippians chapter 3 when he's speaking of the enemies of the cross of Christ. People who are against Jesus. And look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 19. He says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Now, this may seem a little funny. By the way, this, is out of the, this verse is out of the ESV. But when it says that their God is their belly, it means that their God is their own appetite. Their, their fleshly desires are what, are what reign in their, in their lives. It's the fleshly desires that take over and whatever that fleshly appetite is that they have is what they focus on. And look at what it says there, that underlying part. And it says, they glory in their shame. Those hypocrites that pray out in public just to be seen by men, the reward that they get is just simply that they get seen by men. And that is all. But they miss out on the most important part. They don't please God. In fact, God is displeased with this type of action. God hates this type of action. To be a hypocrite is a sin. Let's continue. The next verse, Jesus says, But you 
So now here he makes a distinction, right? He was speaking uh, uh, to these people and he says, don't be like the hypocrites. And now he says, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, right? So here we see the distinction. In the first part, it was speaking of the hypocrite. Now it is speaking to, to you now. I mean, us Christians, us believers, this applies to us. What, what, is, what is the motive behind our prayers? And Jesus isn't saying that it's bad to, to pray out in the public or to pray out in front of other people. But he said it is better to go in private. Here he says the inner room. Now, now in the Greek, this word literally means a chamber or, or an inner chamber, a secret room. And he says, close the door where you are not seen by anybody, but it's just you in intimate fellowship with God, the almighty creator, the one who created you and me, the one who saved you and me to have that secret time with the Lord. That is what reigns over any public prayer. It is your private prayer life. I, I love how Paul Washer says that. Paul Washer says that a man with no prayer life is a useless man. It doesn't matter how much theology they know. It doesn't matter if they have a PhD. It doesn't matter that all the hermeneutics and all these biblical um, fancy words that they use and this and that. But no, if they have no prayer life, they are useless. So, what does this mean for us? We need to ask ourselves so a couple questions. If we need to be real, uh, looking at this verse, we need to ask ourselves a couple questions. And I have them here. And the first one, I'll put it up on the screen. And I want you guys to meditate on this question. No one's going to answer it. But I want you, if you want to note it down, but meditate on this. The first one, do I pray more frequently and more fervently when alone with God than I do in public and just meditate on that question is your prayer life greater out in public in front of others or is it greater in private and, and this is really really important for us because a private but private life of a christian is who he truly is and the private life of a, of a Christian is you'll really see with the type of person that they are. I, I mean, a man devoted to God is a man devoted to prayer and studying the scriptures. And this is not just a once in a while thing, but a daily thing. We see in the Psalms that, that when the psalmists speak and, and, and they're praising God and, and they're, they're studying the word, we see that it's, they usually do it in the morning, the first thing they do when they wake up. But it should also be the last thing that we do before we go to sleep. We should start our day in, in the word and prayer and end it in the word and prayer. The next question is this. Do I love my secret place of prayer? Is it something that you desire for you to just go home and go into that, that secret place, maybe just in your room, but to be in prayer is that something that you desire is this something that even exists in your life and this doesn't just apply to you guys but it applies to me it applies to keith it applies to pastors the lord i mean who every single christian it applies to everyone every single person so we need to hold each other to this standard last question is is my public praying simply the overflow of my private praying and, and what this means is that you can tell based on how a person prays if they have a private prayer life or if they don't and it's not to call people out or to start judging people but it's to get real with yourself do you struggle praying in public in front of other people and you don't know what to say? That means you probably don't even pray, uh, pray in private. 
a man or a woman who prays in private, they know how to speak to God. And it's not something that they have to study on their own, but it's something that they just do. If you don't know how to pray, just start praying. It can be simple as going into the Psalms and reciting Psalms. See how the psalmist cried out to God. I, I mean, we, we have everything that we need to pray. We don't have to be these great giants in the faith to have the secret life of prayer, but it is every single one. Whether you were saved last week or you've been saved for the last decade, this must continue in your private prayer life. I love what, um, what D.A. Carson says uh, about this. And he says this. He says, Could it be that the prime reason we do not see prayers answered is because we are less concerned with bringing our requests to God than with showing off before men? And, and just think about that. I, I mean, a uh, I, I, I hear it all the time, people saying that, man, it's just, I feel like God's not answering my prayers. I, I feel like this and that. And you know what? Maybe God is being silent. I, I don't know. I, I don't know for your specific situation. But bring your request to God. I mean, we are to pray for one another. We are to pray for our problems. We are to pray for our future. We are to pray for everything. I, I mean, everything. The Bible literally says, don't stress about nothing. Don't be anxious about nothing, but pray for everything. So I, I, I just love this. Could it be that the prime reason we do not see prayers answered is because we are less concerned with bringing our requests to God than with showing off before men? What is your motive? If, if you're someone who prays out in, in public in front of others, what is the motive? If you're someone who teaches in front of others, what is your motive? It is it to, to be seen as the spiritual giant, as someone who is a prayer warrior or a theologian or a Bible nerd. What is the reason? And the sole reason just should be to please God and God alone. I mean, Paul makes it clear in Galatians that if he, if his goal was to please man, he would not be a servant of God. He would be a servant of man. But no, Paul is not a servant of man. He is a servant of God. So his sole purpose is to please God in everything that he does. And we should too. We are Christians. We are believers. Ones who follow God. We are now indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that those who live in the flesh cannot please God. Brothers and sisters, if we're Christians, we are to live in the Spirit. And the Spirit knows the thoughts of God and, and knows what pleases God. And guess what? If you walk in the Spirit, you will also please God with your life. Worship isn't just singing and listening to songs. But worship is how you live your daily life. And that includes prayer. Amen? Amen. Let's continue. Matthew chapter 6 verse 7 says this. And when you are praying... So really, really quick, Jesus here presupposes, which means that he is, he already makes the, the statement when you are praying, meaning Jesus is already thinking that the people he's speaking to already do have a prayer life. Why? Because it's, it's part of the Christian life. It's part of the life of the believer. It's an oxymoron to say that a Christian doesn't pray it doesn't make sense but no a christian is supposed to be dedicated to prayer so let's continue and when you are praying do not use meaningless repetition as the gentiles do for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words so what does this mean what this means is that um, in context, the Gentiles, meaning those who weren't Jews, um, in the first century, which was the time of Jesus, they participated in pagan idol worship. And this involved repetitive chanting of words and phrases. And they did this because they thought that they would be heard by repeating their prayers. They think they thought of their gods like humans. 
And maybe you guys can relate. I don't know if you guys did it when you guys were smaller with your parents and when you just nagged at your parents to, and you just begged at them that they may allow you to do something. And you just say, mom, 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 or, or dad, you know, please let me do this. Please let me do this. Please let me do this. And they think of God in that same manner. But God is not like that. Now, it is to believe that some of the Jewish people that Jesus here was speaking to might have adopted this same style of praying to where they just repeated the same thing over and over and over, thinking that they would receive whatever they asked for just by repeating it many times. But God is not like that. God is to be taken serious, especially in prayer. Prayer is an intimate and sacred time with you and God and how you approach it is very serious. Very, very serious. It's not something to just take it lightly and, and, and you know, just joke around about it. But no, look at what Ecclesiastes says. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 2 says, do not be hasty in word. What does that word mean? Hasty. Hasty quick, hurried. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. When you go to prayer, careful on, on what it is that you're praying and how it is that you're praying. Jesus, um, gives an example and we're going to go into it tonight of how it is to pray and i hope that we can all learn from it whether you do have that prayer life or you don't we need to continue this um, and really be devoted to a life of prayer one second okay um verse eight verse eight says this so jesus continues and he says so do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him right why is it that we don't need to go to God and keep repeating what we're what we're saying and just thinking that he's gonna hear us better it's because he already knows what you need before you even ask him why God is all knowing he is sovereign he knows your needs he knows what it is that you need, Christian. And this should bring comfort to your life that the God, the one that created you and me, knows you, knows you better than you even know yourself. And he knows what you truly need. Now, this may pose the question, and many people have asked it, if this is true, if God already knows what we need before we even ask him, then why even ask him? Or in other words, if God knows what we need, then why even pray? And a lot of people have asked. It's a very, very popular question. But I'm going to give you a very simple answer because we are commanded to. It is the way that God made it. Now, do I know how exactly it works? I don't. I don't know exactly how it works, how it is that prayer changes things or how it is that prayer works with God, but it just does. And God made that a means for his glory. And it's, it's amazing that we get to partake in that via prayer. So the Bible says, like I said earlier, worry about nothing, but pray about everything. That's Philippians chapter 4, verses 6. And seven, take that to heart, to not worry about nothing, but to pray about everything. That means every situation in your life, big or small, you bring it to God. In First Thessalonians chapter, chapter 5, verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. What is the word ceasing? Without stopping. All right. And how does this look? To always pray daily. Don't skip that day. Maybe you do feel tired in the mornings. Maybe you do feel exhausted at night. But make that sacrifice to pray. Make it a daily practice. I love how um, 
one time here we had a Q&A with the elders and it was very beautiful. I, I can't remember who said it, but one of them said it. Um, he was talking about pretty much the um, uh, the discipline, pretty much your, your discipline and, and, and the stuff that you currently practice now. That, you know, it, it's very important for you to really have that prayer life now because it'll be much more difficult in the future when you have a spouse and when you have kids and you have a whole family. If you can't do it right now when it's just you, what makes you think you will do it with your whole family? Right? So this is something that must begin now, today. If you are not someone who prays on the daily, do it. I, I mean, like I said earlier, that what we learn, what we hear, isn't to just go in one ear and go out the other, but it is to take action, to learn and to apply it into our lives and now have a change of heart and mind in our daily lives. This is part of what sanctification looks like, to be made holy, to be made more like Jesus Christ. And guess what? Jesus was a man of prayer. So we have the greatest example in Jesus. Jesus, the son of man, the second person in the Godhead, was a man of prayer. And I just want you to think of that, that Jesus was a man of prayer. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, the disciples approached Jesus. And what did they want to learn from Jesus? Somebody help me. What did they ask Jesus to teach him how to do? to pray. They have witnessed Jesus up until this point, do miracles, do all, all types of wonders, you know, in front of many people and out of everything that they witnessed Jesus do, they were most intrigued by his prayer life. And they wanted to know how to pray. That must mean it's something very important it really is. If that's what stands out in Jesus' life, it must mean that it is something that is very important to continue. The Bible makes many exhortations for us to pray. Paul writes it multiple times in his epistles, exhorting his audience to pray, to devote their lives to prayer and to pray for their situations. And like I said earlier, Jesus was the ultimate example for prayer. There's a quote that says, prayer is for God's glory and for our benefit. It's a benefit for you to have that prayer life and it is for God's glory ultimately and superiorly. Let's continue. Next, here's where Jesus has the outline uh, of how to pray. And many of us know it as the Lord's Prayer. And it is found in verses 9 through 13. And it says this, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a beautiful outline, an example of how we should pray. And why do I say it's an outline? Because Jesus there in verse 9 says, pray then in this way. You know, showing his disciples how it is to pray how the outline should be. And here in, in this prayer, we see six different petitions, three to God and three to the individual. Let's break down each one of them. So verse nine, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, what does it mean to hallow someone's name? What it means is to make or to honor as holy. So to honor God's name as holy. Now, remember how I told you earlier, it is very important how, we, how it is that we approach prayer. Why? Because when we approach prayer, we are approaching God. 
And, and if you don't know who God is, get to know God. The more and more that you know God, the more that you will fear Him. And, and people think of that word fear as this horrible thing. And yes, it is reverence. But at the same time, there should be fear as well. Why do I say that? Think of this as an example. Whenever you guys have experienced or been in, in, in a huge, um, let's say a thunderstorm. I don't know about you guys, but when I hear thunder going crazy, I ain't gonna lie, I get a little nervous. I'm like, dang, bro, it's kind of scary out here. It's loud, you know. But God, imagine how it is to be in the presence of God who creates all of that. And all of that is just tiny compared to him. It's nothing compared to him think of all the the big and, and the monstrous things of this earth that you fear I, I mean i am scared of the ocean when i see the ocean and the waves i'm like oh my goodness I, it, it really does scare me but god is the one who created that god is the one who created everything here on this earth the planets the stars the universe i mean it the universe is enormous but that is our god the one who created all of it the one who created you and me in such a complex manner that we'll never be able to understand but this is the god that we approach so honor his name as holy why because he is holy he is set apart from us he is not like us the bible says that his thoughts are not like our thoughts his motives are not like our motives we think that we know the way the ways of god but we have no idea look at what the bible says about god's name psalm chapter 8 verse 1 says oh lord our lord how majestic is your name in all the earth who have displayed your splendor above the heavens god's name is majestic we continue in psalm chapter 9 verse 10 and it says and those who know your name will put their trust in you those who truly know god are his children God's children, God's very own, are the ones who truly know God. And look at this final one. I will give you thanks forever because you have done it. And I will wait on your name for it is good in the presence of your godly ones. So remember that when you approach prayer, remember who it is that you're praying to. You're praying to God. Get to know your creator. Amen. Let's continue. This next one. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All prayer. Listen carefully. All prayer must submit to God's purposes, plans, and glory. When you pray, you are to pray in the will of God. Why? Because His will is perfect. His will might not be what you want, but it is what you need. And I want you guys to look at this quote from A.W. Tozer. And it's a very beautiful quote in regards to God's will. And he says this, I am thy servant to thy will and that will is sweeter to me than position or riches or fame and i choose it above all things on earth or in heaven meditate on that i, I just do you have the same attitude when it comes to god's will does it reign in your life or do you rather have your own fleshly will And when it comes to God's will, the Father's perfect will, we have a great example. And who is that great example? Somebody help me. Jesus. And where do we see that? We see it in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus is arrested. What did he do? He cried out to the Father three 
times to let the cup of wrath, God's wrath, pass from him. But he said, not my will, but sure will be done. Jesus is the perfect example of what it means to submit to God's will. Right? We are Christians. And, and what does the word Christian mean? Little Christ. People who follow Jesus, people who follow his teachings and his ways, who want to mirror Jesus in their everyday life. Well, let me tell you, Jesus was known to be a man of prayer and a man who submitted to God's own will. So what does that mean for us? We should do the same. And guess what? Does God's will look pretty all the time? Not in the beginning. Because it didn't for Jesus. We, we see Jesus. And what, what happened? God's will was for what? For him to endure the sins of you and me on the cross. For God's wrath to fall upon him. The perfect and, and holy one. The only one who was ever good. What did God's will look for Paul? I, I mean, we saw this man was shipwrecked multiple times. This man was beaten and lashed multiple times. This man was thrown in prison multiple times. This was God's perfect will for Paul. And you may not like it at first, but it is for what? Not the temporary good, but for the ultimate good. For the eternal good. God's plans are good. Why? Because he is sovereign. He knows what's best for you and me. We don't. And when we think we do, that's how you know we are prideful people. And guess what? You can have it your way or you can have it God's way. But God's way is the perfect way. So when you come to prayer, it is to have God's will, his perfect will be done into your lives. Amen. Amen. Let's continue. In verse 11, it says this, Give us this day our daily bread. So I want you to notice something, that only after submitting his prayer to the will of God does Jesus introduce the first request. So this is the first request to man. And it says this, Give us this day our daily bread. Now what is the daily bread? Um... And honestly, people will say different things. It may be speaking of physical bread, but it may be the spiritual need of the believer. But I want you guys to go to a passage in Matthew chapter 7. And I think it's just so beautiful. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Next chapter over. And we're going to read uh, verses 7 through 11. And it says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you? When his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? That last part there, the last sentence, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? This is why prayer is important. It is to ask and just like verse 11 says, to ask for the daily bread. And guess what? If we being evil people, people who are corrupt can give, I guess, good gifts. How much more can the God of the universe who created you and me, how much more can he give to you? Remember that God knows your needs. Ask your father. Ask him. I mean, we are beyond blessed that we have the ability to pray to God. Ask. We get to. Jesus, in, in, in chapter 6, he, he says, he tells his disciples to not worry about food. 
Why? Because the, even the sparrows of the field eat. He tells them not to worry about the clothes or their clothing. Why? Because even the lilies are clothed with the glory that's even greater than Solomon's. The lilies of the field. And guess what? If God's creation in his birds and in his plants and in his trees and in everything else, they are provided, how much more you who were created in his image. We are above all other creation. How much more do you think God cares about you? But Jesus ends it by saying, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you so make this a daily goal to always seek after the kingdom of god and the righteousness and these things will be added to you amen let's continue jesus says and it continues in this prayer and he says and forgive us our deaths depths as we also have forgiven our debtors Amen. This is very beautiful. I really love this. So I actually want to compare it to another example of this prayer in Luke chapter 11. And it says this, and forgive us our sins. So instead of debts, it says sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. I mean, let's go back. Debts, when it's talking about debts, is speaking of our sins that we may, may that we may be forgiven of our sins but look the most important part is this last part where it says as we also have forgiven our debtors it, it doesn't say and then we will forgive our debtors those who have done wrong against us but no it says as we also have speaking in past tense meaning that the christian who has been forgiven of his or her sins has already forgiven their brother and their sister or anyone who has done them wrong. Look at what God question says about uh, about the situation. Or where's it at? Oh, no, I think I didn't put it out here. Okay, I'll read it to you guys. Um, <clears throat> oh, never mind. I think I just lost it. Okay, it's okay. But um the, the the main important thing is that it already presupposes that the believer or the person has already forgiven those who have done wrong to them a christian is supposed to be merciful and what does that mean what does it mean to have mercy on someone else it means that even though that person deserves punishment you withhold from that why because god has forgiven you and shown you mercy the greatest mercy ever his wrath that you deserve for your sins so the christian is supposed to forgive and show mercy to everyone who wrongs them let's continue uh, verse 13 says this and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen what's beautiful about this is that towards the end of this prayer uh, jesus says that to not lead us into to pray that, that we may not be led into temptation and be delivered from evil. This is very, very important. Why? Because we Christians still live in the flesh. And what does our flesh want? To do what is wrong. Our flesh only wants to please our, our, our sinful desires. It's all it wants to do. But guess what? We also have the Spirit. And the two are in constant battle against one another. Why? Because they tug at different direction. When your flesh is tugging at you to sin, the Holy Spirit is tugging at you to not sin and to approach God. The Holy Spirit knows what is pleasing to God. And guess how good God is. He is so good. Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says. It says that no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape 
also so that you will be able to endure it. What does this mean? It means that there is no temptation that you cannot overcome as heavy as it feels, as strong as it feels. And as much as you think that you cannot overcome it, God says that there always is a way out of temptation. And guess what? Us as believers are to always pray that we may not be led into temptation, but be delivered from it. To always seek after God and his goodness. And, and if you're someone who is battling temptation so bad right now. Where it just feels like you can't do anything about it. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to the spirit. To the desires of the spirit. Walk in the spirit like we are commanded. And guess what? There will be a fruit in your life. And in that fruit, part of that fruit is self-control. To endure these type of situations and these type of temptations. Very quick, let's look at this last part of this prayer. And it says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Jesus here ends the, the, the example, the the. Um, um, the the model prayer with an adoration to God. And guess what? He opened it with an adoration. And guess what? We are supposed to do the same. I love what H.B. Charles says. And he says this, the petition of our prayer should be sandwiched by the statements of God, meaning that we open up prayer by acknowledging our creator and we end it by thanking our God. It is to be, our prayers and petitions are supposed to be sandwiched by just adoration of our wonderful God. Um, so here Jesus has presented us the perfect example of how to pray for, for uh, how it is that we should pray. But we don't end there because shortly after this, after this example, Jesus says this very important thing in verse 14 and 15. And he says this, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. And I want you to let that sink into your heart. Let it convict you. If you are someone who cannot forgive another person, you need to repent and you need to be worried. You really do. And I mean, we see this example. Jesus brings the analogy of the servant who owed the king an immense debt. And guess what the king did? He forgave the servant of that debt. But what did the servant do? He turned his back and he faced somebody else who owed him just a tiny amount. And he demanded that debt from him and choked him. What? In the same way, you Christian have been forgiven of the greatest debt ever. But you can't forgive another person of a tiny debt of a tiny wrong that they have done to you you and i we sin against the holy god day after day after day countless amount of sins towards this amazing and holy god and somebody does one wrong thing to you they look at you one wrong way they say one wrong comment and you can't forgive them you should be worried why this is where the quote was. Um, I love how God question says it here. He says, Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15 is saying that anyone who refuses to forgive others is demonstrating that he has not truly received Christ's forgiveness himself. Any sin committed against us, no matter how terrible, is trivial in comparison to our sins against God. If God has forgiven us of so much, how could we refuse to forgive others of so little? I want you to look at this verse and just compare yourself to this. Are you someone who has forgiven everyone? Not just most people, but everyone and shown mercy to those people. It doesn't matter how evil of a thing they've done to you. I know it's easier said than done, but it is a must for a Christian. I mean, I've seen examples. 
out on YouTube or the news of Christians forgiving their family members murderers. I mean, people who have murdered their family, their fathers, their daughters, their sons, and they go up to this person and they forgive them and tell them that their only desire is not for them to rot in jail, but for them to know God and to be forgiven of their sins. How is it that people like this, Christians who have been shown the, the, this immense forgiveness can do this, but you cannot? And the reason you can't it's probably because you haven't received that forgiveness yourself. And it's time to truly wake up. You need to be shaken. I mean, someone ought to shake you. Really, I mean, the, the word of God here is active and living. And guess what? It is here to teach. And it will hurt. It will. I, I mean, it ain't easy. It ain't easy. The Bible, the word of God is a pride killer. Guess what? Us as humans, we have that national, national, natural tendency to be prideful. And guess what? When we devote our life to reading the Word of God and studying it, it will begin to cut and destroy our pride. I think it was my brother Frank who said it a couple weeks ago. He said that God is not out. Oh, what did you say, Frank? He said something that God is out to destroy and kill your pride, correct? Yeah, to kill your pride. And guess what? It is done through the word of God. It is done through prayer. I mean, really analyze your life. It doesn't matter how wrong of a thing that someone has committed to you. You have done far worse to God. Think about that. Last verse to just meditate on. Paul here tells the Ephesians, he says, Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. These aren't suggestions. When you read this, you're not like, Ah, oh, you know what? I might do this. No, this is a you will do this. You will be kind to one another. And guess what? That doesn't just include people that love you. It includes people that hate you and that say bad things against you. We read it earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, right? To, um, to love and to pray for those who persecute you. Are you doing that? I mean, if that's happening in your life, are you doing it? But guess what? Be kind to them. Have that tender heart. If you have that, that heart of stone within you, pray that God will replace it with the softened heart. I just pray that all of us may have that soft heart within us to receive even the people who hate us. Jesus doesn't just tell us to love those who love us. He tells us to love our enemies. And Jesus does not suggest that. He commands it. So it's very, very important. But overall, from what we learned today, it is to be, all of us, all of us included, to be reminded that we must be men and women of prayer, every single one of us. And I'll be honest, I lack. I lack. There is places where I lack, both in reading the Word and in prayer. And I feel almost like a hypocrite being up here. But guess what? That finger that is pointed at you is also pointed at me. God is not showing partiality, but it is all upon us. And we need to analyze our lives, but be devoted to prayer. We have an outline on how we should pray. If you're someone who's new to the faith and you don't know how to pray, well, guess what? Now you do. Look over this passage when you go home. Be in God's word. Meditate on it and pray about it. Pray about every situation in your life. If you're feeling uneasy, if you're feeling anxious, it's because you are not Praying, be devoted to prayer. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, meaning pray without stopping. That should be our goal to always and always and always pray. Amen. So, um, and remember to forgive everyone because God has shown you forgiveness.